Chapter seven, plant assets, natural resources, and intangibles. The learning objectives will be number one, explain how to account for the cost of plant assets. Number two, distinguish a capital expenditure from an immediate expense. Number three, explain how to account for depreciation on plant assets. Number four, analyze the effect of a plant asset disposal. Number five, apply gap for natural resources and intangible assets. Number six, explain the effect of an asset impairment on the financial statements. Number seven, analyze rate of return on assets. And number eight, analyze the cash flow impact of long-lived asset transactions. When a company incurs a specific cost, the question is, is that a cost of an asset or is that a cost of an expense? If the cost has a future value, if the company writes a check and purchases something that has future value, then we consider it to be an asset. Some examples of plant assets, specifically plant assets, are land, buildings, machinery, equipment, furniture and fixtures, land improvements. So those would be plant assets. We're also gonna talk about natural resources, and we're also gonna be talking about intangible assets. When a company has a cost and purchases something that has no future value, we consider them to be an expense. An expense is a cost that has no future value. Now, even though we purchase an asset, as an example, like buildings, machinery, and equipment, the initial cost will be considered to be an asset. But over the life of the asset, we're gonna be lowering that value on the balance sheet. We're gonna be what's called depreciating it over its useful life. And while we're depreciating it, we're lowering the cost on the balance sheet and we're taking that cost and expensing it on the income statement. And we refer to that as depreciation expense. Now, when we use the word depreciation, we commonly think of things like when you go out and purchase a vehicle from a car lot, a brand new vehicle from a car lot, immediately while you drive it off that lot, you incur depreciation, the value diminishes. Now, although that is somewhat related to the accounting concept of depreciation, it's really not about the fair market value of the asset. It's about taking the original cost, whatever the cost was, let's assume it to be $10,000, and allocating that cost of $10,000 over the useful life against the revenue that's being generated from that asset. So if you purchase a vehicle for $10,000 and you project that it's gonna be useful for you for five years, then you will depreciate that cost, that $10,000 over five years. And while you're doing that, you're gonna be recognizing depreciation expense. You're gonna initially consider it to be an asset and then you're gonna recognize that cost as depreciation expense over the five years. When we're talking about natural resources, they also diminish or their value does diminish or that original cost will be allocated. When we allocate that cost, we're gonna call that depletion expense, not depreciation expense, but depletion. So natural resources will be related to depletion expense. And then when we lower the value or adjust the cost of an intangible asset, we refer to that as amortization expense. So simply just remember these expenses and what they relate to. Depreciation expense relates to buildings, machinery, equipment, furniture and fixtures, land improvements. Depletion expense relates to natural resources and amortization expense relates to intangible. Now note something here. When a company purchases land, the land is never depreciated. So there is no expense on the income statement that relates to land.
The next question might be is, well, what costs are going to be incorporated in the cost of the asset? And the rule is the cost of any asset is the sum of all the costs incurred to bring the asset to its intended use. The costs would include the purchase price. Well, that's, that's pretty obvious. That's the purchase price of the asset, the building, the equipment, the vehicle, you know, the cost is what it costs. But there are some questions you might have come across in your mind is, okay, well, what about taxes? Well, if there's sales tax involved, that's gonna also be added to the cost of the asset. How about if we pay somebody commission on that purchase? The answer is yes. You will add that cost of commissions to the asset costs. And you're gonna really add all costs that make the asset ready for its intended use. When we buy land as an example, well, there are a lot of different fees associated with land. And so that's a, that's a relevant question is what of all those fees and those charges that are going to be associated with the purchase of land, what of those costs actually get added to the cost of the land? Well, the purchase price, that's pretty obvious. Broker's commission, just like before, survey fees, legal fees, that property taxes, if you have to pay, if you have to pay the cost of back property taxes as is associated with the purchase of the land, that's going to be added to the cost of the land. Expenditures for grading and clearing the land. See, that's kind of interesting. If you have like a mess there that you're buying a piece of land that has a building that's dilapidated that you have to remove. Well, the land by itself at that point when you purchased it with the, with the dilapidated building is not ready to be used. So you might incur some expenditures for removing it, clearing it. And in that, the grading and the clearing of the land, those costs will be added to the cost of the land. And then just like I mentioned before, the removal, removing of unwanted buildings. So we're talking about grading and clearing. If there's weeds, brush, trees, whatever it may be, those costs are going to be added to the cost of the land. And if there's a building there that has to be removed, that cost will also be added to the cost of the land. So let's take a look at, at an example here. FedEx signs a $300,000 note payable to purchase 20 acres of land. FedEx also pays $10,000 for real estate commission, $8,000 of back property tax, $5,000 for removal of a building, $1,000 survey fee, and $260,000 to pave the parking lot, all in cash. Well, life must be tough to have that kind of cash sitting around, but Federal Express is a relatively large building, so they probably do. What is FedEx costs of the land? Well, we can go through this pretty easily. First, the purchase of the land, 300,000, that's definitely the cost. That's gonna be added to the cost of the land. We're gonna also add related costs, 10,000 commissions. Why? Because it's necessary in order to put the asset to its intended use. Back property taxes fits the same definition. Removal of building, $5,000. That fits the definition as well. Survey fees, $1,000. So when we add up the 10, we add up the 8, the 5, and the 1, the total comes up to $24,000. Now, we'll look at the $260,000 to pave the parking lot. $260,000 is not the land cost we will capitalize that cost. And when I use the term capitalize, I mean we're gonna consider it an asset. It's not gonna be an expense, it's gonna be an asset. We will capitalize that $260,000, but it's not gonna be, that $260,000 is gonna be classified as improvements, okay? Improvements, it's gonna be a separate line item. And the main reason why is because a paved parking lot will depreciate over time. So for us to keep track of that depreciation and what costs need to be depreciated, we have to break those costs away. So even though you could argue, well, wait a minute, wasn't that necessary to bring the land to its intended use? That was necessary, but it was added after the asset was ready to be used. So once it's ready to be, to, to put a parking lot on top of, then now, 
those costs after that will be treated differently because, because they are very likely going to be depreciable. So this $260,000 to, to pave the parking lot will be treated as an improvement, a separate cost. It will be capitalized. It will be an asset, but it will be treated separately. It will not be added to the cost of the land. So when we're actually making the journal entry, it's going to be real clear, 300, the land will cost $324,000. We got that from the total cost here that we summed up all the costs, 324,000. That was from the previous slide. That's going to be our debit, $324,000. The credit will be $300,000. That was for a note payable. In the explanation, it says that it paid it says that Federal Express signed a $300,000 note. So we have to account for that. Note payable, $300,000 credit. So, so far we have land of 324,000, note payable 300,000. So the difference, well, it tells it's all in cash. It had to be paid in cash. So that credit's gonna go against cash. Now let's discuss how we're gonna account for the cost of plant assets, including buildings, machinery and equipment. We're going to look at the same thing. What Again, what cost will be added to the cost of construction buildings, as an example. I've got a good reference here because the building where I work, where my accounting office is, is an office that me and two other individuals built. So I am a part owner of that building. And so we had to break it down our costs consistent with GAAP. So the cost of construction of a building includes architectural fees. So when we, per, when we had to write a check out to pay for the architectures, to put the plans together, that's part of the building costs. Building permits, those are pretty expensive in these areas, but we, do ha we did have to pay the city and the county for permits. Contractors charges, payments for material labor and overhead. And here's the, the kicker, when you borrow money to, per, uh, to build something, you need to also, you, you might be paying interest while you're building the building, while you're actually, especially if you've got a, a, a essentially a line of credit that gets be, becomes available to you for construction. It's a construction loan. And while you're pulling money out, you're incurring interest. Well, that interest that you are incurring during construction will be added to the cost of the building. The cost of purchasing a building, well, you're not going to be incurring all those costs that we talked about before, like architectural costs, uh, contractors fees, none of those costs are going to exist because you're not building the building. But if you're purchasing a, an existing building outright, you will have the purchase price, you will have brokerage com and commissions, you would have sales and other taxes. Although for real estate, there in California, there's no sales tax on, on California, so that's good news. Expenditures to repair and renovate buildings for its intended purposes. So if you buy an existing building and you have to gut it out, for example, to, to make it so that you're gonna remodel the land. So when you remodel it, all those costs um, will be added to the cost of the building. And let's look at equipment now. Equipment would include the cost that'll be added to the actual equipment that's being purchased would be the purchase price, any transportation from the seller. So if you bought something from New York and it's big and it has to be put into a big freight carrier and it's gonna cost a lot of money to get it delivered out here or even by truck, well, all of those costs are gonna be added to the cost of the equipment. Insurance while in transit, sales and other taxes. Unfortunately, in the state of California, if you buy equipment, you're going to be paying some sales tax. Purchase commissions, installation costs, expenditures to test the asset before it's placed in the service, and costs of any special platforms. So this is interesting. The expenditures to test the asset before it's placed in the service. So, you know, if you think if you're buying a piece of equipment that you have to just set up in your production line, you may have to run through some tests. You may have employees working there. You may have contractors working there. All those costs that you are incurring to test the asset for its intended use will be added to the cost of the equipment. 
and any cost of any special platforms if you had to build something in order to get that piece of equipment in the service that's what's going to have to be put in play okay the land improvements and leasehold improvements remember that par um, that parking was it a parking lot I think it was a, a, a paved parking spot paved parking lot that's what it was that would be the land improvements so i told you it would be capitalized but it would be capitalized as a separate asset under a separate category and that would be land improvements and leasehold improvements um, leasehold improvements the example i could give you that this is if you lease well in the building where my accounting office is i lease the building to the owners of that of that building and I just happen to be a third owner of that building but that's a separate entity that's another company that owns it I'm, I'm a third owner of that of that company but me as an accountant as an accounting firm we pay lease payments to that to that other company well let's say uh, me as a CPA as an accountant I decided that you know what I really want to change things up I want to knock this wall down i want to build another office here uh, i'm probably going to want a long-term lease in place if i'm going to do this or maybe even the owners would require it but let's assume that everything is okay with that and i'm going to put in new buildings and it's going to cost me ten thousand dollars well i don't own the building but i can make those kinds of improvements and in in that process those are going to be what we refer to as leasehold improvements you don't own those improvements and if for some reason you have to walk away you're going to end up losing those costs because they you know they they're not you can't walk away with that building anymore all right so improvement improvements made to lease property that's the leasehold improvements uh, will be depreciated or amortized over the lease term so if i have uh, some improvements in there that i've built into that building I'm going to write those off. I'm going to depreciate those over the lease term. If I only have a five-year lease, then all of those costs are going to be depreciated over five years. Now, often when you purchase assets, there's somewhat of a, a lump sum or basket purchases of different assets. This is very common when we're talking about the purchase of buildings, but in most cases, you just don't purchase a building. You purchase the building and the land that it sits on. Well, those are two separate assets. Remember, the land is not going to be depreciated. The building will be depreciated. So you have to break those costs up. So the lump sum or basket purchases is really a purchase several assets for a single lump sum amount. The total cost is divided among the assets based upon the relative fair market values. And this technique is called the relative sales value method. So let's take a look at a specific example here, Federal Express again. FedEx purchases land and a building in Denver. The building sits on two acres of land and the combined purchase price of land and building is $2,800,000. Very good. An appraisal indicates that the land's market value is 300,000 and that the building's market value is 2,700,000. So you would think on the surface, well, that means that, you know, 2,700,000 for the building and then 300,000 for the land. Well, why doesn't the seller sell it for $3 million? Which is a reasonable question. But for whatever reason, because it's a basket purchase, because it's something that's gonna be come, coming together, a seller might be motivated to go ahead and sell it for the basket value and therefore make it available so that the, the buyer will be motivated to buy it. So here's the example of how we're gonna account for this. Okay, so we have the land and the building, we have the column set up, we have the asset, the market sales value, the total market value, we have the percentage of total market value we have the total cost and the cost of each asset and the cost of each asset so based upon the explanation here the land is valued at $300,000 building is valued at $2,700,000 so that means that the total value the total sale the total market value is $3 million 
we're going to take each one of these values, the sales value, the market value, and we're going to divide that by the total value, which is going to give me, which is going to give me the ability to find out the market value of each of these assets relative to the total value. The total value again was 3 million. So the question becomes is, well, what percentage or what proportion is the land relative to the total? Well, if I take the 300,000 and I divide it by the total and I set it up this way, so it makes it easier for us to see what we're doing. 300,000 divided by 3 million, well, that's 10%. And then we'll do the same thing for the building and that's 90%. That should be pretty obvious because the sum of these, since we're getting the relative values of the total land and building, the total percentages should be equal to 100%. Then the question becomes is, well, what was the total cost? What was the total cost of the land and the building, which was 2,800,000 and that would be applied to both the land in the building, that's the total cost. But now what we're gonna do is we're gonna take the land relative value, relative sales value, 10%, and we're gonna multiply it by 2,800,000. So 10% times 2,800,000. And that's gonna give me $280,000. So since I bought the, the, the total land and building for 2,800,000, 280,000 is gonna be allocated towards the land and 2,520,000 is gonna be allocated towards the building. The total of these two have to equal what the total cost was, 2,800,000. And now I'm ready to book that journal entry. I know that I have land, land and the land value that I ended up getting was $280,000. So we'll go with 280. That's my debit, that's a purchase of land. We're gonna go ahead and add costs to the building. Cost to the building is $2,520,000. And then my corresponding credit, I'm not gonna look, but I'm sure it was for cash. So we purchased this all for cash. And the amount we paid was for it was really the sum of the debits and credit, or the, the sum of the debits rather. So that's $2,800,000.